everyone, it is 8.33 a.m. on this Tuesday, November the 21st. And as usual, we will start our meeting with our chaplain prayer and pledges. And we are delighted today to have Chaplain Ralph Dawkins here to lead us in both. Please come forward. Good morning. Uh, before I pray, if I may say just happy pre-Thanksgiving to everybody. We have a lot to be thankful for this year, and I hope that everyone will have safe travels and journeys and enjoy their families. Uh, I was reminded to uh, just keep us in mind, keep reminded in your prayers for Mayor um, J.W. Lawn, who has passed away. He was a mayor in San Angelo for a while, and we just want to keep him in, his, in our prayers. But today, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to invoke your word through prayer into this gathering of city officials, leaders, and concerned citizens. I pray that these city leaders, as you have given unto them the responsibility to watch and guide over our city that they serve, I ask that you work mightily in them today. I pray that you will come into this room and cause them to have a productive meeting and lead each and every one of them so that way they will make fruitful contributions to deal with every agenda item today. I pray that you'll enable them, O oh Lord, to think and strategize in ways that will bring great results. So I pray today that for the mayor, I pray for the, her staff and assistants, I pray for the city council members, the city manager, and every person and department that is instrumental in leading and directing our city. I pray for the fire chief and the police chief and the entire force and the sheriff's department and all the first responders of our city. And lastly, I pray for continued economic prosperity and safety for our city. May you draw in and attract to our city industry, businesses, and corporations that will produce jobs and revenue to help us all to grow and prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor to the flag of the United States of America, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Lee, please come forward. Merry Christmas. Bright and cheery today. Bright and cheery today. Yeah. Beautiful day in paradise. It's paradise where we live. And no doubt about it. 2023 marks the 30th anniversary of Concho Christmas Celebration's annual tour of lights. The celebration, with over 3 million lights, is one of the largest Christmas lighting events in the state of Texas. The event offers a two and one half mile walking or driving tour beginning behind the main post office on the corner of Abe Street and First Street and ending at El Paseo de Santa Angela. Those involved consist of hundreds of community volunteers who greet tour guests and mates from the Department of Corrections and Tom Green County Sheriff's Office community work detail who assist with installation of Christmas scenes, the members of the San Angelo Restaurant Association who supply meals to the inmates. The Community Christmas Tree Lighting Ceremony will be held Saturday, December the 2nd, 2023 at 5.15 p.m. at the corner of South Chadburn and West Concho Avenue. Activities will include the San Angelo Community Band conducted by Dr. Constance Kelly of Angelo State University and the Twin Mountain Tonesmans directed by Mark Clark. The 21st Annual Lights of Christmas Parade will follow the Community Tree Lighting at 6 p.m. The parade may be viewed on Chadburn between 4th Street and Concho Avenue on Concho Avenue between Chadburn and Oaks, and on Oaks back to Second Street. The tour of lights can be seen Sunday through Thursday from 6 to 10 p.m. and each Friday and Saturday from 6 p.m. to midnight December 2nd through December 31st, 2023. Now therefore I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby declare December the 2nd, 2023 as 
Concho Christmas Celebration Day and encourage citizens to join the activities and view the magnificent holiday lights that have become a community treasure. May I present you with Thank this? Thank you, Mayor. And would you please offer comments? Sure. <clears throat> well, we're going to have a celebration of Christ's birth. Uh, this is going to be our 30th annual uh, tour of lights, and we're our whole community organization, our volunteers are real excited. We've we've uh, changed the route a little bit, which I'm sure as you get through, you'll just have to watch the eras. We're going to go back on Irving and then back across on A Street. Uh, so we won't be going through down the, the hassle of downtown this year with the stoplights. We've got that all uh, figured out. We're coming in behind the, uh, behind the museum and then hook around into the El Paseo de Santa Angela. And so uh, for the crescendo of the whole tour, the other, uh, the other big thing that really hadn't been announced till today, with the mayor's uh, permission, we'll, uh, we're going to have uh, a corporate sponsor this year for the first time. Re Reliant has done it in the past with their hats. Uh, this year we, uh, we got Chick-fil-A to be our, our uh, tour sponsor, and they are going to give a uh, gift card with each, to each person that comes, to each car that comes through the tour for some of their uh, delicious morsels out there in their, in their places. So we're real excited about that. We think uh, the people coming through, the tour coming through, will not only have a uh, full stomach, but they'll also see the, some of the most beautiful lights uh, that uh, the state of Texas has to offer. Love for all of you to come out, which I'm sure you will. And uh, we will see you and have a Merry Christmas. So is Chick-fil-A every night of the parade? Every night. Not of the lights or just uh, one night? No. Uh, what we did last year, we did a little try, and uh, they gave out sandwiches uh, during one, one night of the tour. This year, they, we've got uh, 23,000 gift cards that we're going to staple to the bags that we give to each car that has the survey and the and the candy canes and all that in there, there'll be a there'll be a, a, a gift card on each one of the bags that goes into the car. So uh, there'll be a, a various opportunities to uh, for something free to eat from Chick Fil A. So we're really excited about it, and we hope uh, we hope the community is going to really enjoy this 30th annual annual tour. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yep. for clearing Come that up. Yeah. Come on. Let's have a picture. <laughs> We will now go into the public comment section of the agenda. Uh, it, we will start today with some comments from our city manager, Daniel Valenzuela. Huh? Oh. Uh -huh. yeah. So um, each of you will state your name and address or SMD area. Each citizen can speak just once per item unless asked to comment by council. Public comment will be for three minutes unless extended by council or translation services. A proponent or opponent, five minutes unless extended by council or translation services. Council has no obligation to respond to comments or questions from the public. Any response from a member of the city council to non-agenda comments is limited to a statement of specific factual information, recitation of existing policy, or directing staff to place a subject on a future agenda. So, Daniel, you want to wait on your comments? Is that what you want to do? Okay. With that, we will open up the floor for public comment. Good morning. This is a legal delivery and not a public comment. The recording of this meeting shall suffice as evidence of this delivery. 
served to the City Council by John Barrio, single member District 2, on behalf of numerous registered voters, many of whom would be at risk if they spoke publicly. Citation, November 21st, 2023. The City Council is hereby served this citation for the intentional, repeated, and habitual subversion of the City Charter, violation of certain ordinances of this, of this City, under the City Charter, effectively the City's Constitution. The San Angelo, pardon me, San Angelo is chartered under Texas laws as a council manager form of government. Instead, San Angelo is being operated as mayor run. Individually, collectively, pardon me, individually and collectively, the council, including the non-voting city manager, aided and abetted by the city attorney, has illegally deviated from the charter without voter consent, allowing one individual access to the manager and directing specific actions without the deliberation by and specific author authorization of the full council. All members of this council are complicit for not openly challenging these actions as required by ordinance. Under the Code of Ordinances, the laws of the city which are required to be followed to the letter and spirit of the law. Under Section 1.02 City Council, the following subsections, 004 and 005, the Code of Conduct and Rules of Procedure for City Council Meetings, 006, General Policy Role, particularly the Council Manager Structure of City Government, 007, Ethics Standards, 008, General Conduct, 009, Harassment, 010, Conflict of Interest, 015, violations of the code of ethics or code of conduct. Your redemptive window shall be, repentant and law-abiding conduct must be publicly evidenced no later than January 1st, 2024, else there will be consequences. Any and all discussions by council must be conducted openly in compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, lest consequences commence immediately. Any in initiative to amend the charter or related ordinances shall be construed as defiant conduct and shall immediately bring consequences that follow. The consequences. By charter, the voters are judge and jury and shall prosecute these violations by petition and ballot. Unless accelerated by council's responses, on or after January 1st, 2024, the voters may petition for a recall election firing of any and all council members, including the mayor. Recall elections shall, be, shall then determine the fate of this council and the future of our San Angelo. Thank you. Yeah, I'm confused by... I am actually quite frankly confused by Mr. Barrio's comments as far as um, the insight he has into the interaction that we have. I'm not sure exactly where you're getting all this information, Mr. Barrio. I'm really confused uh, as far as the interaction that city council has with the city manager and the staff. I think it's riding in, in alliance with what the city, uh, city manager form of government is. Uh, I just, I, I, don't, I don't grasp this. As far as firing our, our city council members, that's even, I don't need a comment from you, sir. I just need to finish my comment. I'm confused by that. Um, Mr. Barrio, basically what you're implying and what I'm looking at is you're trying to say that this council has been a complete and utter failure in representing its citizens. That's not true. That's not true whatsoever. Having had an opportunity to work very closely with this group of council members, I can tell you I've been doing this for 20 years now. This is one of the best councils that I've been very fortunate and blessed to work with. Um, you look at our track record as far as what we're accomplishing, uh, and you choose not to look at track records. You want to focus on laws and everything else, we do follow the law, sir. The track record speaks for itself. From addressing uh, water needs for the next 75 years to dedicating 11 to 12 years every year for infrastructure purposes without increasing the property tax rate. Uh, from visionary emphasis on economic de development, focusing on planes, trains, and automobiles, Mr. to developing, let me finish my comment, sir. Uh, that may be your own comment. Uh, it's time to cut this off. Thank you very much. No, sir, it's not. I do believe that he is speaking of factual information yes, that you yes, are allowed to give during the public comment period. So you may continue, I am. Daniel. Thank you. Uh, again, 
and, and he's walking out because he doesn't want to hear this. Uh, okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's been a lot accomplished, Mr. Barrio, and, and, and to the audience, uh, they were quite proud of. You know, when you look at a fiduciary responsibility, you look at where we are right now, our, our, healthy, our fund balance is probably the healthiest it's ever been. Well, the city council has done a lot of working together. Is this city council perfect? No, it's not. Uh, I, I don't know of a single city in the state of Texas that doesn't have issues that they're working on. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know of a single city in the whole United States that doesn't have issues that they're working on. Um, you know, but the answer is never, let's get rid of all the city council members. When you look at that attitude, uh, it's extremely short-sighted, and it's very irrational, Mr. Barrio. Unfortunately, the way that I look at it, and I will make this comment, some people do thrive on the chaos they can create uh, to divide a community, which serves absolutely no purpose whatsoever other than to make us look foolish in the eyes of the observers. This is deeply concerning to me, especially because we're trying to recruit the best ta talent to our community when it comes to replacing positions, encourage economic developers to invest in us, entice visitors to come to our community to stay in our hotels and spend money with our local businesses, and improve, improve the overall quality of life for our citizens. Call me naive, but I believe in the decision making and the wisdom of the voters of this community who elected this city council to represent all of us. Mr. Barrio, you're saying that the voters got it all completely wrong, that you know better than they do. I don't believe that for one moment, sir. Ms. Thank you. I, too, am going to make some public comments, so um, if you would allow me this opportunity, thank you. I will remind you that that was the delivery on behalf of numerous voters, not my own words. First of all, I and all of City Council strongly support our police officers. We understand that what they do adds tremendous value to the equality of the life we have here in San Angelo. We know that having a strong police force keeps our citizens feeling safe and secure in their home in their, and in their place of business. I also want to address the issue that has been reported that I, as mayor, want to have more citations and tickets written. If you watched the entire video, you would have heard my message. It was simple. Public safety is very important. It is up to the police leadership to determine how they do that, create public safety. We as a city council have no authority over the police. As a council, it is our duty to ask questions, and writing more tickets on citations was not the message. Public safety was the message. As Chief Carter said to me, nobody likes tickets. We got that. I repeat that safety and the well-being of the citizens is a top priority. Over a four-month time period, we met to discuss budget issues for the 2023 and 2024 budget. When the budget was announced late, with late September, we as a council believed all issues, including pay for all employees inclusive of police officers, had been addressed. Obviously, they had not. On the subject of property taxes as a council, our ability to address the issue is based off the property tax rate which has been approved by City Council. For the second year in a row, we reduced the property tax rate. In the two-year period, we have reduced the rate from a high of 0 0.776 by seven, over seven cents. As mayor and council, we have no authority over the tax appraisal office other than the appointing individuals to the board. Their primary job is to evaluate the tax appraisal leadership. We have no authority over the tax appraisal districts as it relates to the dollar value of your property. If you do not like the system, please contact the Attorney General, the Comptroller's Office, and Governor Abbott, or your state elected office, uh, officials, Senator Perry, and, or the House of Representatives, Drew Darby. They passed the legislation that controls property taxation. As a council, we only have a vote on the rate, not the dollars that the rate will be applied to. 
The last issue I want to address is the animal shelter. The two biggest issues are aggravate or aggressive dogs and packs of dogs. Dogs are smart. Pa packs of dogs are moving targets. By the time a call is placed and an ASO officer arrives, they have scattered. We are relooking at the city ordinance to determine changes that must be made to control and deter the dog packs and the aggressive dogs. No one wants a child to be attacked by a dog. No one wants anyone to be threatened by a dog. Your input is needed and wanted. We are looking at all the issues attached to these problems. People and ideals will help solve the issues and problems. Every city is dealing with too many unwanted pets now that COVID is over. This has created an even bigger problem as most cities are like San Angelo over the capacity of their shelters. We have very limited avenues to deal with overcrowding. Prior to COVID, we had cities who needed more animals for adoption. That is not the case now. For example, in Dallas, the first week of October, they were 162% over their capacity. This problem will only resolve itself if people take responsibility for the animals they own and adopted. We will ask for monthly updates or quarterly updates from city staff to make sure that the public knows what we are doing to attack and resolve the issues. We, the City Council, are not happy with the negativity surrounding the annual shelter issues. Change must happen, and we're here to make that happen, all for the safety of our citizens. Thank you. We will now open the floor oh, for additional public comments. Mayor. I'm sure there are Mayor. some individuals here who would. Oh, yes, please. Um, I have a public comment I'd like to make. Yes. Um, I just want to make an announcement that on November 29th from 4 to 6 p.m., we are going to be discussing the ADA self-assessment that the City of San Angelo has completed over the past few months. Um, it will be a town hall format so people can come and give us their comments regarding that self-assessment. Uh, you can find the self-assessment on costatx.us backslash ADA. There is a quick link to ADA self-assessment. You can review a draft of that document as well as <clears throat> complete an online form with your comments if you are unable to make it to the meeting. You can also email me at teresa.james at costatx.us um, or use any of the links on our website to submit information or comments regarding that assessment. Thank you. Yes, please, Tom. Teresa, if somebody doesn't finish their second consecutive term, are they eligible to come back for re-election? Yes, based on what we've looked at in the charter. Okay, so the, if somebody didn't complete their terms, happen. they're eligible to come back and run for <coughs> some more terms. Yes. Cool. That's all I need to know. Further public comment? Please come forward, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Mike Burnett, single member of District 1, speaking on behalf of the Concho Valley Homeless Planning Coalition and Concho Valley Community Action Agency. As you're aware, this last week was uh, the annual Hunger and Homelessness Week. Uh, we had a number of events, including a symposium conversation on Tuesday, uh, where about 60 or so uh, citizens were there speaking about homeless issues. Uh, thank you to Council Member Hesse Smith for attending and uh, listening to that conversation. Uh, as you know from, uh, I come up here quite often and talk with you about our homeless, uh, we have an uphill fight to assist those in need in our community. The first step has been to provide some sort of congregate emergency shelter, and I'm very excited to be working alongside Major Martinez of the Salvation Army in bringing the Salvation, the Salvation Army's emergency shelter back online. Um, it's, taken, it's quite a bit of team that we've assembled for this uh, to make this possible. Uh, definitely with the Salvation Army's assistance, uh, the city, United Way, Concho Valley Community Action Agency, and the Homeless Coalition working together to provide solutions to bring the, the shelter back online sooner rather than later. That's only the first step. Uh, as we work to house our homeless neighbors, uh, we need to look at creating some sort of transitional housing with case management, uh, permanent supportive housing, and affordable housing options for our homeless neighbors. The dialogue that we engaged with to bring the emergency shelter back online shows what can happen when the right people are in the room. I would hope that we could build on that and press forward. 
Thanks to Facebook memories, uh, this last week, um, a memory popped up on my Facebook to a year ago, which was one of the first times I spoke with the council about hunger and homelessness week last year. And at that meeting a year ago, uh, we talked about, or I mentioned bringing a task, creating a task force to the council. The pace of government sometimes runs slow, but we can see based on what we've done with the emergency shelter coming back online, that if you get the right people in the room, we can move much quicker. So again, I am asking the council to place the creation of a homeless task force on the next agenda. Thank you. Further public comment? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Major Afonso Martinez, Salvation Army. Uh, thank you for giving me this a moment to, uh, to speak on behalf of the Salvation Army. Uh, it is, Mike did make a comment from the coalition. That it is good to be able to work together with him uh, and trying to get um, our shelter back online for the community. I just want to assure the city that that is our endeavor uh, to get that, that place up and running again. So this way, our, our neighbors who, are, who don't have a place, have a place to come in. And so I'm working, I'm working fervently to get this done. Uh, and hopefully uh, by 24, by the end of 24, we'll be open 365 days. So I just wanna make that, that, you know, that is what we're trying to do. Uh, and currently right now, we're about 90% done and getting our shelves up and ready for the inclement weather, as we started, stated. And we got a couple of cold nights coming up ahead uh, right now, and we're already making preparations for our folks that are going to be coming in as we speak right now uh, so we can house them over the next couple of days. So I just want to let you all know that. Thank you. Sir? Yes, Larry? Uh, you're still looking for volunteers to help out in there, is that correct? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, yes. And do you, you know, have a, a phone number that we could, uh, we could give those folks? <laughs> <laughs> Hesitation. I, I, yes, I'm trying to remember the number. Um, 325. I think the number's coming right behind you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's coming to you. Yes. 325-7000. I mean, 6891. Repeat that again, please. 325 655 6891. And I'll and I'll, make it also, Major, uh, uh, could you set up some kind of a schedule? This week is, uh, is a mess, as everybody knows, but can you have some time frames that if people have a, a bit of uh, an opportunity? to come over and volunteer that you can yep. schedule those things? Yes, sir. Actually, uh, if what we're doing, if you could call um, Janet Leonard, our volunteer coordinator, her number is 432-266-3971. That is her cell number, and she'll coordinate. Right now, we do have some groups already lined up that are coming in to help uh, clean and everything. In fact, we're even getting, uh, got some paint donated from Sherwin Williams. So we can paint the place so when they come in, they're coming to a fresh place um, and be able to just get out of the elements and, and relax for the night. Okay, yeah, you got the paint, you got rollers and... Oh, we're working on those, yes sir, I do. Okay. Yes, I'm waiting for that donor to call and say, hey, I got you, you know, but yes. But thank you, and again, thank you for the city, of, uh, the community here in San Angelo. Since we've gotten here, it has been a brush of fresh, fresh air. Uh, to come into a place where they're wanting to know what the Salvation Army is wanting to do. And I'm one of those products. I grew up in the Army as a kid. I, I, I prospered through the programs, and when I say prospered, I learned what it was to give back to the community, and I believe that wholeheartedly. So in the time that we're here, this is what the Salvation Army will get from, from the Martinez uh, Command mm -hmm. that we want to give to the community, because it's about them, nothing about myself. Oh, yes, so I was reminded. So anything that y'all want to give, including from the communities, paint rollers, brushes, tar mats for the ground so we don't stain the floor, are more than welcome. Just call us and we'll pick them up. Or you can drop them off at our place, 34 West 3rd Street. I know that one. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor, I do want to say yes. that uh, the major mentioned the breath of fresh air. Actually, he's been a breath of fresh air to work with. Um, I've had a pleasure of working with numerous majors in the past, and this gentleman right here is not a talker, he's a doer. So uh, our deepest, deepest gratitude to you, sir, and thank you, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Further public comment? Okay, so we will move on to our consent agenda. I'm gonna start with Larry. Do you have any items you would like to pull off the consent agenda? No, ma'am. Karen? No, ma Lucy? Jay. Jay? Harry? No, ma'am. Tom? Nothing to pull. Okay, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item J? So moved. So moved by Harry? Second. Second by Larry. All the any public comment concerning any of the consent agenda items? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Consent agenda, with the exception of item J, has passed six to zero. We will now move into item J, which is considered supporting the private fundraising efforts to implement and place art at the San Angelo Regional Airport passenger terminal and authorizing the city manager to accept any proceeds and negotiate and execute all related documents. Okay. Carla, Jeremy, can, you're on, both of you, I guess. One I'll, at a time. I'll, I'll, let me give the introduction and other folks can come up. Good morning, council, city, city manager. Uh, with the designation of San Angelo as the uh, visual art capital of Texas for 10 years, a few years back, um, some folks, um, started talking about the possibility of adding art to the passenger terminal of the San Angelo Regional Airport. And uh, those folks uh, approached the Public Art Commission. So the Public Art Commission uh, discussed this matter uh, about a year ago, in January of, uh, of this year. And uh, they were interested in proceeding with, with art at the, this location. Um, and so uh, the Art in Uncommon Places was at the meeting at the time. And so they asked Art and Uncommon Places to come up with some concepts for what this art could be at this location. And so with that, um, they also presented this to the Airport Advisory Board to make sure that they were okay with uh, adding art to this location. Uh, we got the green light for that. And so the Public Art Commission again reviewed the, the, this matter with the concepts of the art at different locations at the airport. And let me show you those, uh, and then we have some folks who can talk about the art and talk about the airport. Now, I would, well, I'll, I'll get into it and I'll explain. This is the, as you know, the, the main entrance uh, and exit to the airport. As you see, there's, there's no art. This is the concept that would definitely uh, show that art is present in San Angelo as you arrive to the airport. I'm going backwards. There's also this um, art furniture. And so this was discussed at the last board meeting with the Public Art Commission. Uh, some members of the Airport Advisory Board were also present at that meeting. There was some concern about the placement of these. And so we will find a place for these. It could be in the outside uh, under the, the foyer, the, the entrance to the airport. Uh, it could be in perhaps the seating area or nearby, near the seating area. Some possibilities, but we, we will work with the airport staff and the airport advisory board uh, in terms of placement for that fur furniture uh, to make sure we comply with FAA regulations and restrictions. The other area to add art is the check-in uh, area. The the baggage claim area, and this back wall, which is also an exit and an entrance. Also the escalators that connect the gates to the security area. There's a palette of ideas that the Art and Uncommon Places is working with. Uh, they'll have to explain this, some of this art. This is uh, above the escalators. This is along that back wall um, by the baggage claim area and that exit. This is above the, the check-in area and at the check-in area. You can see that mural at the back exit. 
This is at the baggage claim area. And these, this is a representation, but these would be stacks of vintage suitcases, which are pretty cool looking. And there is a ledge above that baggage claim area. And, and on those, that luggage would be different stickers that show different art groups, inc including the city that are involved with art in San Angelo. Brian? <laughs> so if, if you have any questions about um, the airport, uh, Jeremy's here, and if you have questions about the art, uh, Art and Uncommon Places is here. I'd like to just say that the following about the art, I want to make sure when we do the art that it is um, creates a point of view or authenticity about who we are as a city. The art as presented is colorful and bright and beautiful, but it doesn't tell much about the story of San Angelo. And as people are standing, waiting for either to board a plane or to get their luggage, it would seem that we would want to help tell the story about San Angelo. Just my comment. Okay. Any questions or comments? No, I'll agree with the mayor. I think we should Let me turn the mic on here for Brian. Smacks me. But anyway, uh, would love to see it more appropriate for the venue. I would say let's just make sure we do it, and maybe if we could vet that back by run it back by council or have some approvals and reviews of that before as it goes up. Good old ranching, sheep and goat, country town. Yeah, so they can come up with some exact things of what they want to do and then we'll bring those back to council Perfect. for review after they go to the art commission. I definitely like the suitcases, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm happy. Julie's here to, yeah, I was gonna. Uh, this is a beginning. This is a backdrop to what we could do. And so all the things that you're talking about could be included too, but we've got to have a color impact on this for it to have, and the continuity of the color palette needs to go together. But there's lots of opportunities for things that we've done in the city that are augmented, that could tell stories like that and still use what we're using. So um, it would be great if, and we did a lot of research about airports and what's making people come and wayfinding. And we definitely want that. And um, on the suitcases, we are having businesses of places that you could go to and think sites that you can see. Um, the others were just... Um, you know, colorful murals because of the spaces that we were given. But we can go back and do more. Jeremy? Yeah, and if I just may, uh, Jeremy Valgardson, airport director, if I just may speak on behalf of the airport board, um, they support the concept, but they kind of had the same thoughts as, as you, Mayor, and, and Councilman Thompson. But um, they want to see the Mathis brothers highlighted, of course. They want to see the, the history of San Angelo kind of brought out in the terminal, but they do support the, the concept of having art in the locations that were proposed to you today. Great, thank you. And there is no private funding going towards this. So this is a grant that Art and Uncommon Places will have to write. And we've already missed one cycle, and um, we're hoping, <laughs> because it took a while to meet with the Art Commission, and so we'd like to move forward. Uh, we were not paid any money for this design, and so, I mean, I, you know, we just need direction on what you'd like to see happen. Thank you. All right, with that, is there a motion um, to approve item J? Well, was she saying that there wasn't going to be private funding or? There is the private fundraising she she... effort. Oh, so. Okay. Yeah, I move to approve. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Tom. Any public comment, further public comment? Uh, good morning, Council Mayor. Uh, Welcome Anna, back. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Anna Bartosz, single member, District 1. Um, just recently, I was visiting my daughter and had to fly out of the Pasco Airport, which is northwest 
uh, U.S. Uh, in Washington State. Anyway, just walking around the airport because we, obviously we were delayed. Uh, but looking at the floor uh, in in uh, Richland, in in that area, the Tri Cities area, they have the Big Columbia River, and they have the Yakima River, and on the floor. Uh, leading to the restaurant that had the Columbia River and the Yakima River and where they join. I thought that was quite interesting as far as local um, art, I guess, in, in that airport. And also on the wall, they had etchings of their big wheat production area, and so they had that. They had other things. So I thought that that might be something that we could include in this is our Concho River and uh, things that our town is known for. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? <laughs> Good morning, Mayor, City Council, Susanna Valenzuela, and Jaime Capatio Jr. from uh, Single Member District 1. I serve on the Art Commission, and I had the opportunity to work with uh, Julie Raymond and Gigi on this project. And um, I kind of wish you would explain a little bit more about the people. Um, in the, in the drawing that are gonna be on the wall, just that come from all um, areas and things like that. And it isn't specific to San Angelo, but it will have uh, QR codes and different things like that that can be directed to the art that's in the community, just kind of giving people a taste of that. And so thank you for um, letting me speak. Thank you. Further public comment? All right, with that, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0. We will now move into the regular agenda. Comments regarding items on the regular agenda may be made by the public when each item is discussed as outlined above. Applicants, proponents, and appellants are exempt from the time limit above and instead must limit their remarks to less than five minutes. We will start with item A, consider approving by board contract 706-23 with Bobcat Company for the purchase of five mowers with the option to purchase one additional mower in the amount of $81,834 utilizing $7,456 from Fairmont Cemetery fund balance and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Ryan, you're on. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Mr. Valenzuela. Um, as read, uh, we are requesting uh, for purchase these units to go to various divisions. Just a quick breakdown of those units. Three units out of the general fund, equipment replacement fund uh, for $43,207. Uh, one unit for water reclamation, $14,701 out of the sewer fund. And one unit for Fairmount Cemetery, $7,455 uh, for one unit. Uh, the additional dollars you see there is the request of a possible one additional unit purchase uh, in the event that we find the need uh, and the budget when the time comes. Uh, for a total of $81,834 as Mayor read for approval. Uh, with that, staff simply recommends that uh, we purchase these units to be applied in our fleet. Can you give us an update on those autonomous mowers that we've purchased? How are they working? Is Are they what we expected? Uh, the day after they moved away? Not, not lost. Uh, we know exactly where they are. Um, the units, I know the division uh, down at Sports Complex are working on the infrastructure to uh, properly equip those units for function. So there, there are some additional things that you might not think of that has to be done. So poles that, are, that have to remain up uh, for signals, um, areas to be mapped. So they have a list, a checklist of things, and so they're, they're working diligently on that so that they can get those mowers moving. Luckily, we're in the right season that they have a little more time uh, to work through that. Questions for, right, yes, Tom? So, turn on my mic. So Ryan, are these purchased locally? Do we get them from somebody like, I know we always try to push that and promote that. Does that happen on this one? I noticed they're Bobcat, and I wasn't familiar who's a Bobcat representative here in town, but I know there's Exmark and Kubota. Right, yes sir, the, uh, these particular units would come from Bobcat of Abilene. Uh, they are local in the sense that they're here all the time. We have a considerable number of equipment from them already, so the support has been good. We have looked at other units in town, and for various reasons, whether that's price or functionality, um, this was the choice that we believe to be best. Uh, you know, and that's understood. I just, everybody on this, 
council loves it when we spend our money at home. And it, I agree. As long as you yes, can try sir. to do that and comply by that, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, okay. Ryan. Of course. Other questions for Ryan? Yes. Yes, Karen. Um, Ryan, would you kindly clarify for us the discrepancy between one unit for the sewer fund and one unit for the cemetery fund? Absolutely. The cemetery utilizes a smaller machine to get in and around their, their obstacles, if you will. Um, and so that's the exact reason. So out at the water reclamation facility, they have larger wide open spaces and can utilize a larger mower for time efficiency purposes, where the cemetery unfortunately doesn't have that allowance. Larry, did you have a question or comment? You look like you were moving forward. That was it. Okay. All right. All right. With that, um, we uh, is there a motion? Motion. Um, so by Karen Hasn't, a second by Harry. Public comment concerning these items. Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of approving item A, say aye. Aye. Motion passes. Six zero. Item B, consider awarding HGAC contract number AM10-23 to Razor Limited for the purchase and installation of two ambulance modules in the amount of 428030 for the fire department and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. And you are on Fire Chief Corey Sanders. Good morning Come on. and happy Thanksgiving. Thank yeah, so I mean, just as it says, this is, uh, this is to approve the purchase of uh, two ambulance box modules, which put simply is we have two chassis. We're gonna drive them down to Houston and Frazier is gonna put, basically turn them into ambulances. You're gonna put the big box on there, do a few other modifications <laughs> and uh, it's to approve that process, so. Questions? Yes, Harry. What's the timing on getting them back fully furbished and ready to go? So when the, after the moment we drop them off, it's usually two to four week process. Very good. Thank you. So. Further questions? Motion to approve is presented. Thank you, Harry. Second. Second by Lucy. Public comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Motion passes 6-0. <coughs> Thank you. Consider, item C is consideration and possible action regarding the creation of a reinvestment zone for tax abatement purposes at 2702 West Loop 306, also being lot one, block two, sub lot Southwest Plaza addition 3.826 acres, the proposed location of Technology Towers LLC in accordance with City of San Angelo Code of Ordinance Article 1.09 taxation. Division three, uniform tax abatement policy. Michael, you're on. Thank you, Mayor. Michael Dane, Interim Economic Development Director. I'm glad I didn't have to read that in caption. Yeah. We, we are following up today with the beginning of the, uh, the, of the uh, process to create uh, a tax abatement. We had lots of questions last time. We've got S solid estimates now. Uh, for what the impact would be and so we brought we're bringing this back to you as a concept get your direction to move forward or not at this point um, Technology tower is a, a joint venture between lo two local uh, technology firms uh, They they have purchased the Cytel building they anticipate with the purchase and the improvements They'll invest approximately 5.1 million dollars they have 59 current employees. They anticipate hiring up to 20 additional employees. And the estimated economic impact over 10 years is more than 59 million. The COSA, you ratified a plan by COSA DC to uh, uh, deliver $200,000 associated with capital investment and $50,000 that is dependent upon job creation. The topic today is about a possible tax abatement which, uh, which is all on the city side. COSA DC discussed it and was aware of it, but it's not within their power to uh, take action on that. So that's purely a city side item. This is uh, anticipated look of the new facility or the, the new facade on the facility. This fits into a strata for a 60% abatement, um, assuming that the uh, values come in within that range. 2.5 to 5 million. 
With those estimates in mind, the estimated abatement over seven years would be um, a little over $89,000. They would continue to pay taxes estimated at just under 60,000. The net taxes over 10 years would be approximately 96,000. The net 10 year city benefit would be approximately 324,000. The community benefit would be approximately 702,000. Remember that there are other taxing entities in the city who would benefit from increased tax base. Explain that further, please. The county and the school district would also benefit. Great question, Mayor, thank you. Um, their revenues would go up as the taxable value goes up also. Payback period over for all incentives, 7.6 years. And that assumes zero inventory. In other words, if they develop some aspect of the, their business that included a significant inventory, that, that, that would have an impact on taxes also. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is, I believe one of the questions that we couldn't clearly answer is what happens if, and there were a couple of different things. So let me start by giving an answer before I give the question. And that is that in last year, the value on the property was approximately $1.2 million. This year, as of 1-1-23, the value is um, approximately half a million dollars higher than that. That stepped up value will be the base year. That's where we're starting. If we grant an abatement, it's abatement on the marginal increase on the improvements and the equipment. So if the land goes up, they still have to bear that tax burden. But when, the, when, they, when they increase the value of the improvements, that marginal increase, they will, will be abated in accordance with the terms of the contract. Now, these estimates are based on what they plan as inputs. What actually ends up on the tax rolls is up to the appraisal district. So if they invest $3 million, but the appraisal district says that's worth $2 million, then that's what ends up on the tax rolls. If, if, the appraisal, if they invest $3 million and the appraisal district says, oh, those are worth $4 million, that's what ends up on the tax rolls. But doesn't the tax taxing entity, the appraisal district, primarily go by what they see from the outside, not what's inside? I don't know how they would measure that, Mayor. Uh, I, at times, they... Uh, I think one of the inputs they have used in the past is the value associated with the information you put on your permit for construction. Um, That's a good explanation. So I don't know what they're doing today for commercial properties. But these are estimates. We think that over the fullness of time, this is we're, this, we're in a pretty good place on this one. And we do recommend approval if you're inclined to do that. Um, However, as one of the other, other items we discussed in that other preliminary discussion was the difficulty associated with the new state restrictions on the growth of our property tax revenue. So we're understanding of your dilemma, um, but this is what we bring forward to you today. And we will propose if you approve this and direct us to move forward, we will, we will start stepping through the process. The next step Bob tells me is a public hearing. Could you describe what a technology tower will be? Bob, can you help me with that? <coughs> Excuse me. Basically, it's going to be it will be the headquarters for the two companies, VGI and uh, Schneider, uh, and that's where they'll run their operations out of. The rest of the building, they will. Uh, will be available for lease, so there are, there's the potential for a lot of other companies to come into that that building uh, that would generate additional revenue, probably additional tax revenue. Uh, one floor is set up to be a data center, which they intend to uh, try to get uh, facilitated, uh, bring in a firm that would operate a data center there. That's usually a lot of very high priced capital equipment. Uh, for, that would also generate a lot of tax revenue. So there's, what we're looking at really is the building uh, and the two companies' assets. Everything else in the building uh, is potentially taxable uh, and taxes to be paid by other companies that we don't even know yet. 
How many floors are in the building? Six, I believe, six, seven. I'm, I'm not so sure. So how many floors will be occupied by VGI? And I believe they're going to occupy one floor each. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is there 10? Okay, so two floors will be occupied. Right. That's my understanding. Six floors, including the first floor. Yeah, if you use the bottom floor as scale, that's a single floor, and, and just use that and move it up. Each floor would be two of those. Okay, so do, um, are there further questions or comments? Yes. Yes, go ahead, Tom. So Michael and Bob, so the tax abatement we're granting is to Snyder and VGI. So what if they flip it? I mean, what if somebody comes in and says, I like your facility, like what it is, I want to buy the whole building. Do we convey that tax abatement on? I think it'd be cool if we have somebody that you know, wants to come in anyway, but how does that go if they try to terminate and, or they sell the property? Well, it, the abatement will be in the name of uh, Technology Tower LLC. Okay. And so uh, I believe the agreement would, uh, we'd have to get Brandon to help us, but I believe the, agree the agreement stays with Technology Tower LLC. And so uh, I think in order to retain that, a, a suitor would have to buy the company, but Brandon would have to help. You're, you know, this got a little further down in the weeds and I really wanted it to go. I was just like, how are, you know, we keep an eye on that as we go. And if those things flip, there's a point where we keep it back in, so. Well, I think everyone thinks it's a great, I mean, I'm not speaking for everyone, but if there's any further questions about what this could mean down the road, please make a comment. Karen? I have a question for you based on that question. Would you prefer to see a, the, something in the agreement that says this is non-assignable? That this agreement is only with Technology Tower? I, I don't know if I want to handcuff somebody like that. Okay, there might be something where somebody could come in with a lot more people, and I think we need to stay out of the private business sector, you know, from as far as a government range. I would hate to handcuff them with that. Do you, do you want the right to approve an assignment? I think that would be cool. At least we could review it, and you know, if we decide not to do it, does that make sense? I, I think we'll try to get that, and um, we'll go from there. Okay. Karen? Larry? Larry? Yeah, you're talking about as many as 79 employees for these two companies. But with the additional floor space there, these numbers could go up double or triple based on the occupancy of those additional. Yes, yes, sir, that's correct. But the COSA DC is only on the hook for the 50,000 associated with the potential for the creation of these jobs. Anything that goes beyond that with a different company or beyond that with this company would just be gravy as far as we were concerned. Karen? A, a prior screen used the word payback. If you can flip back and we can take a look at that, that would be great. Um, it was your lead screen, I think. Payback period, all incentives. Can you talk us through that, please? The software we use to compute economic impact also tells us, based on the inputs we use, for example, COSA DC is going to put 200000 in for capital, and the software assumes the maximum for jobs, which would be 50000 So the cash, the input would be 250000 plus the, the abatement of uh, 89484 the, the software computes how long it takes through increased revenues that that money, those inputs are recovered. Is that right, Bob? Yes. Also include. Further questions? I was just going to say that also includes the cost of services. Uh, for example, police and fire. There's a, there's a factor rolled in there for, for things like that as well. All right. With that, with no further questions, may I have... Larry, did you have another question? When does the Sorry. abatement kick in? Is there a, a period of time where they're basically showing us they're serious? You know what I mean? Well, we're anticipating using the current year as the base year. And so next year would be the first year eligible. They would be eligible. 
but until there is increased value on the appraisal district books, there's no value in the abatement to them. So, for example, if we executed right away and next year was the first year, but they had not completed construction uh, until beyond 1125, then there's no value in that first year to them. The value to them is in avoiding taxes which would otherwise have been billed to them. Further questions or comments? Move to approve presented. M motion to approve. Second, Second by Karen. Public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make a public comment? Oh, yes, Michael, come forward. <laughs> you come forward. Hi. Do we have an option? That was fast. I'm Michael Looney. I'm the VP of Economic Development with the San Angelo Chamber of Commerce, working in close partnership with uh, Costa DC, uh, also with VGI and with Snyder. And we wanted to uh, uh, thank you for hearing this, this case. Uh, in the spirit of what the technology tower is, is to serve not just as a home for the newly formed uh, LLC between VGI and Snyder IT, uh, but also serves as an incubator and a, a collective attractant to other technology companies that are here, those that are in development, and those that are yet to be discovered. And we see this as a way for us to propel forward the technology sector of San Angelo, which is actually a lot more deep and robust than most people realize. A lot of technology companies are very quiet. Uh, a lot of them even tend to be somewhat fractured where you have people doing remote work, but they generate very strong incomes and they provide very, very good services to the multiple industries that they serve, although they do it very quietly. We've discovered a lot of this through our, our Concho Valley Technolo Technology Alliance, CVTA, uh, which we and the CVTA have worked together on trying to build, and we have quarterly meetings where we learn that there are many, many dozens of people uh, 146 members at this point within the San Angelo area that are in the technology sector. A building like this, an incubator like this, helps to serve as a clearinghouse uh, functionally to bring these, these different employees and different companies together. It spurns innovation. It works very closely with the ASU mission, which as we know is very technology heavy under the uh, guidance of uh, staff and under uh, uh, General Hawkins. And so we think this is a really nice step uh, to just further develop the portfolio of industry in San Angelo. Thank you. Thank you. City Council, Steve Hampton, single di district uh, member five. Uh, I have questions concerning, this goes on for seven years uh, it seems it seems to be a little more. It's not using the kiss method apparently. Uh, it doesn't tell us uh, if these are diminishing uh, or increasing uh, requirements on the seven years, or if it's a flat twelve thousand a year. Uh, it it uh, just says a total. I, I would like a little more clar clarification on that. Seems like it ought to only go four years, 25, 50, 75, 100. So uh, keep it simple. Thank you. Mayor, that's a good question. The, uh, in the calculation of that expected impact, the building uh, it steps up in value and then the software assumes that it continues to grow in value consistent with what we've seen with real estate. Real estate continues to grow in value. This assumes that that, that growth occurs, modest growth occurs in that value and that during that time period that, that increased value on the improvements is, is subject to abatement. But it For, is a set dollar amount. The it question isn't. mark is, it's a set dollar amount. In other words, the approval today says we approve this amount of tax abatement, period. Not, it could grow in year two, three, four, or five for additional abatement dollars. It is, uh, typically it is not um, restricted in growth. The value 
that exists pre-construction or pre-improvement is the set value for the time frame, and to the extent that they create additional value that continues to, to increase in value, I'm using that word a lot, but uh, they benefit from that increasing value. To the extent that the investment goes into equipment which depreciates, they lose that over time because they're taxed on that depreciated value. So the improvements to the buildings we expect to, to increase and steadily increase. The improvements money which goes into equipment we expect to depreciate and go downward. And so there's a mix. The value of the real estate grows slightly. The value of the equipment depre as it depreciates goes down. And so it is a mixed. It's not the same amount every year. Right, but you pre presented a total dollar amount. Yeah, yes, ma'am, that, that's true. We presented a total based on the expected impact to tax revenue um, over that seven-year uh, time period. Thank you. If I may, uh, what we're asking for today is to um, for, for y'all to, to direct us to move forward with the process. The next step is um, requires a seven-day notice for a public hearing. So that would be the next step. And then the next step requires a 30-day public hearing, and that's for the actual agreement. So you're going to get to look at this two more times with a lot more detail. Today is just saying we're going to move forward with the process. You have at least two more times to say, no, we're not going to do this. If, if, if the numbers don't work out right. So just want to make that clear. Thank you. Further comment? Lisa, did you have something? No. Okay. We're good. With that, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of approving item C, please say aye. Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Item D. Consider a resolution to approve special use 23-01 to allow a 119-bed skilled nursing facility on property in the heavy commercial zoning district being 8.25 acres, generally located as 3215 YMCA Drive. Aaron, you are on. Good morning, Mayor, City Council, Mr. Valenzuela. Aaron Benoy, Assistant Director of Planning and Development Services. Today we have a special use permit uh, before you for this skilled nursing facility off of YMCA Drive. This facility has come before this group before. Uh, last time was in 2019, I believe, maybe 2020. Then COVID hit and they decided to put holds on the plans, but now they're ready to move forward again. Our special use permits expire at 12 months if they don't construct. And since this has not constructed, they've come back before you now. The property is about eight and eight and a quarter acres, District 1, Tommy Hebert in the Rio Vista neighborhood. You can see the zoning there is heavy commercial. Uh, in just about all of our zoning districts, a skilled nursing facility needs a special use. If you notice that there to the east is going to be the single family residential. You have some multifamily to the south and some general commercial to the south. And the railroad there to kind of the west or northwest is the other border. Uh, this is a very good road over there at YMCA and Sunset, has good connections uh, to Shannon South as well as Knickerbocker and um, Loop 306. Uh, so we think this is a good spot for this. It has a very nice facility design. They have submitted their civil plans for the uh, groundwork as well as an urban design review for the exterior of the building and landscaping, and they are going to improve a sidewalk over there on YMCA Drive. So we do recommend approval for this. Um, we just had those two conditions. They've actually submitted uh, the end of last week and are actually getting ready to fulfill those conditions. Um, but I'll answer any questions you guys have. Questions for Aaron? Seeing none, then may I have a motion for approval? Second. A second a motion by Lucy, a second by Larry. A public comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any none opposed, motion passes 6-0. We will move on to item E, which is the first reading and public hearing of one, an ordinance of CP-23-02, CP an amendment to the City of San Angelo's comprehensive plan changing certain lands from the neighborhood future land use to the neighborhood 
center future land use being approximately 19.705 acres located at the 3,900, 4,000, 4,100, and 4,200 blocks along and on either side of Coliseum Drive south of 43rd Street and north of East 39th. To an ordinance for PD 23-06, a rezoning from the single family residential to family residential and general commercial heavy commercial zoning districts to a planned development zoning district to allow for single family residential, two family residential and neighborhood commercial zoning districts subject to certain conditions and limitations being approximately 19.705 acres located at 3,900, 4,000, 4,100, and 4,200 blocks along and on either side of Coliseum Drive, south of 43rd Street and north of East 39th Street. Aaron, you are on. That was a lot. <laughs> that was. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, Aaron Vinoy, Assistant Director, Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is an area that uh, really was generated by the monument uh, place there on Coliseum. They came forward with a um, an expansion. Uh, they had been under a special use that really didn't allow that expansion, and so we took a look at that area trying to see what around Coliseum, Chadburn, 40th and 43rd makes sense getting to our Coliseum, as that is, in my opinion, one of our showcase facilities here in the community, and we want to continue it to be a, a showcase facility. So the area um, discussed uh, ended up encompassing 19 plus acres. You can see the uh, green outline there. Those are all the properties within the green and the green line touches were notified about this over multiple months. We had discussions with our planning commission uh, and they brought forth some uh, good ideas and, and discussed things with citizens. And now uh, before you is this comprehensive plan change and a plan development. So we are looking at the neighborhood center as the underlying standard and what that allows is some very small commercial development, not major commercial development. It doesn't allow for drive-through type facilities. Uh, it may be your local tax office or an insurance agent. It might be a small uh, mom and pop restaurant that just has dine-in, those types of things. But it also has that it is neighborhood centered, is that it's trying to blend into the neighborhood. It's not trying to overpower the neighborhood and push the neighborhood out. We know this is a an area of divergence with Chadburn pulling off and you have commercial going down uh, Chadburn. There is some commercial starting along uh, Coliseum as well. And so we want to keep that um, with the best ideas in mind of how do people get to the Coliseum. With that, there were certain conditions and limitations that we put in the plan development that our planning commission uh, assisted with this. They would like to see the uh, front setback for any new construction to be about that 15 foot mark instead of the 25 foot mark or all the way at the front. They kind of want that middle ground so they can kind of push some of the parking and the traffic uh, to the rear of the properties. Um, the front setback for non-residential, there will be a little bit of design elements that we were going to ask them to do. Nothing significant or very difficult, uh, but something that's going to enhance the, the area as you drive from Chadburn up to the Coliseum. Uh, we are going to try to limit this, the sizing uh, of signs and freestanding signs so that we're not making the skyline worse for our residents that are, that are in that area. Um, existing use of some of those home structures might be appropriate for offices as we've seen in our downtown area as it's developed. Um, we are going to be very um, cognizant of lighting, particularly if those lights start shining into folks' backyards, but we are looking at the corridor, the, the Coliseum corridor, of that having maybe some strategic lighting over the time, just like our Chadburn projects and stuff like that to mimic that area going to Coliseum. Um, uh, again, uh, we do have that sidewalks that is not for residential. So if a residential property is there, that they're not required to put one in. We have talked with our operations folks as well as Shane Kelton. They said maybe in the future there's an opportunity to partner with a CIP project that they might be able to come and put sidewalks in some of those areas so that's not a burden on the citizens or the business owners that may choose to do some businesses there. Um, in this plan development, we did allow the Burke Monument, which is a light manufacturing type of facility, but it has been there for many, many years. The community enjoys that business being there, and we want to make ways that it can stay there. Um, and uh, 
the non-residential uses, again, uh, we want them to be compatible in size and, and, and scale to what's going on there with the neighborhood. We do recommend approval of the comprehensive plan um, changing from neighborhood to neighborhood center to, light the, to allow the light commercial, um, as well as going to the RS1 district under the plan development that the RS1 is the underlying uh, thing so that residential can continue to stay RS1, RS2, and then that it still allows some light commercial. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, that was a very thorough presentation in terms of issues and items for consideration. So thank you for that. It's well done. I'm going to open up the floor for uh, further questions or comments. Are there any? Yes, Tom. Aaron, I've got several calls on this as it's gone through the past six, seven months. Notifications come out, calls. Everybody's come through and said, okay, I get it, understand it. Um, I would go back to the, the like item number seven on the sidewalks. There's a period of time that you know, I know you're not going to require that a residential, but it needs to be there. I mean, when it becomes rodeo and stock show time, it's probably the most traveled street there. It's, uh, I would think it would be remiss of us not to require that the sidewalks go through. I mean, we, we need to make sure there is sidewalks that go away. I'll address that a little bit, Tom. I, I visited with Shane quite a bit on this, and, and Al actually worked with uh, Sherry on putting together a concept plan for that. Um, because we have the same concern is that basically <laughs> during the rodeo if you live in that neighborhood you can't walk down the street I mean it is so we uh, Sherry actually has a concept plan for that that um, we'll be talking with Shane about trying to work that in under maybe one of their projects where they're doing sidewalk somewhere else because that's a pretty short strip that you would actually be doing and making that a more attractive as well of a, a thoroughfare going to the Coliseum so yes we'll Keep that cool. I, everything I've heard, everybody, once they call and ask the questions, I got notifications and they were kind of confused about the point. Yeah. And uh, this is a long-term vision step. I mean, this is something that's for the next 20, 30, 40 years to make that an entrance into the Coliseum. So we get that. So, you know, so I, within your lifetime? <laughs> my, mine's definitely got a sunset on it. You see what I eat and drink. But anyway, long story short. Um, just to my fellow council members, I, I haven't had any objections to this. Some people brought up questions, but you know, I'm fully in support of what we do, and I think it's a long-term vision of what we need to do out there. So I appreciate it. So is that, that a motion? I'll make a motion to approve as presented. Second. A second by Karen. Right. You, got, we get, you got one in there. Yeah, I did. Lisa, Public comment. I like this one. Public comment, please. Okay, seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item F, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance for PD 23-07 to rezone from the single family residential zoning district to the planned development zoning district with an underlying single family residential zoning with storage units as an allowed use being approximately five acres located at 4415 Armstrong Street. Aaron, you're back on again. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, Aaron Vinoy, Assistant Director of Planning and Development Services. I start with this slide. Um, you see that, that the address 4415 Armstrong Street, there was a plat that went forward to the Planning Commission that created a five-acre tract, which is Lot 4. Uh, you see that it has kind of a, a, a flag, although it's 120 foot wide, but it's a flag that reaches Armstrong Street. So we are talking about that flag portion, uh, which creates Lot 4 at the back that there's been a request that's come forward that they want to do self-storage buildings back there. Uh, it is currently zoned uh, RS1, single-family residential. Most of the areas to the, to the north and west are much larger single-family areas. They are multi-acre. When you see East 44th Street, that is where we get into our typical single-family neighborhood, smaller lot, 50 by 100 lots, and uh, I have a few images of that as well. This is District 2, Tom Thompson in the Lakeview neighborhood, and just to the west of this is the Lakeview baseball fields um, and Lakeview campus. Is there any current storage facility and general vicinity of all the housing in this area? 
not that we have heard of. We've had some proposal for possibly in Shriner Point area, which is further south, south of South 40th. There has been some discussion north of 50th, which is actually outside the city limits of someone maybe looking to put in some storage units there. But we have not had any applications that have come forward that front on Armstrong or 50th to the city that are storage units at this time. So you can see there to the east again is uh, R&E residential uh, and then to the uh, west is the RS1. You can just barely see the baseball fields uh, coming in there. Um, at the time, this did come forward as just a general commercial request. Uh, Planning Commission did request us to do, move it to a planned development. The staff worked with uh, Planning Commission to do a plan development that would have a residential underline that would only allow this building of the storage buildings. However, at Planning Commission, the Planning Commission did vote unanimous, unanimously to deny, and therefore we would need a, a super majority vote of this group to approve and have it move forward for a second reading. We have these conditions here um, that we thought were appropriate to try to help the residential area. Uh, we did have uh, several citizens in the area, particularly two on either side of this property that said they, they did not think this was the place for commercial. Um, again, the, the zoning currently is RS1, and so this would be a change to that zoning to allow that commercial. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so uh, just clarification, so because it was denied by Planning Commission, how many votes today would um, approve it? It would need all six of you. So all six would have to support it. Yes. Okay, with that said, Thomas, in your district, please. Aaron, what was the vote at planning? It was unanimous against. To deny. To deny. And, and I have gotten calls from fellow constituents that are beside this. It's a flag-shaped lot. Um, nobody had a problem with it staying RS1, but going into a PD for commercial, all the phone calls I got were against it, and so I will be the first one to say is I'm against approving this for the storage units. I don't know how that needs to read, but if that's a motion to approve or deny. So you're, you are making a motion to deny the applicant the revised units. zoning. Is that your motion? That is my motion. A second by Karen. Any public comment? Okay, with that, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of the motion on the floor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0. Item G, first reading a public hearing of an ordinance annexing into the city of San Angelo by petition of the property owner an unaddressed 31.356 acre track out of the ABM survey number three, abstract number two four, and BSNF survey number five, abstract number 101, Tom Green County, Texas, located northwest of Arden Road and FM 2288. You are on again. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Aaron Van Oigen, Assistant Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is our first of three series of annexations to discuss. This one is off of Arden uh, Road called Arden Heights. You see the 31.365 acres there. Uh, in years past, they have brought in and annexed some of that area to the south, and they are currently in development of that area. They were able to purchase the area to the north of that and are proposing a neighborhood that goes up there uh, in that 31 acres. It will be future District 6, Mr. Larry Miller, and in the Bluffs neighborhood. You can see the area there to the right, the open space. Obviously, that's our great uh, state park that we have here in the city or around the city of San Angelo. You see Arden Road has some future use of commercial and neighborhood commercial. And then you kind of see the uh, uh, residential that's even further north. This area is looking to be residential. Uh, it is neighborhood uh, for our comprehensive plan. And so they are requesting a single family residential zoning that will be coming to you in December. Um, 
staff recommends approval and acceptance of the service plan. We did talk with multiple groups, uh, internal of the city and external of the city that provide services. We do have the standard service plan that talks about how we would provide services to this. Uh, our first responders are always in our mind of how to get out there and get to those places and, and take care of our community safely. They, they felt that this would be a logical step as they tend to respond out to that area anyway. And so they, they were very supportive of this and staff recommends approval. Larry, do you have any comments? Yes, ma'am. I was very happy to see your remarks in it concerning parks. This is, would be beautiful in terms of supporting not only this neighborhood, but the Bluffs that does not have a park in it. So thank you very much for including that comment on the uh, underserviced areas. Well, I, def I definitely want to give our credit to our city staff, uh, uh, Sherry Bailey, our principal planner. She worked on this annexation plan and, and discussed that with, with staff and made that recommendation. And so I, I, she deserves all the credit for that. Good on you. Any other comments? All right. Is it, Larry, would you like to make a motion for this? Certainly. I'll make a motion to approve. May I have a second? Second. Second by Harry. Public comment? Seeing none. Or hearing none, take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0. We will now move into item H, first reading and public hearing of one, an ordinance annexing into the city of San Angelo by petition of the property owner an unaddressed 28.860 acre tract out of C. Berberick, survey number 177, abstract number 52, Tom Green County, Texas, located west of Foster Road and south of West Loop 306, and two, an ordinance for Z23-12 to rezone the property from the unzoned land to the general commercial zoning district for the northern 10.814 acres and to the low-rise multifamily zoning district for the remaining 18.046 acres. Aaron, you're on again. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Aaron Vinoy, Assistant Director, Planning Development Services. This area is, is being called La Vista. It is off of Loop 306 and to kind of the west, northwest of Foster there, as you see on the screen. Backs up to the old stone addition that we annexed in um, around 2018, 2019, and starting to see some single family homes being built there. A, the front portion of this is in the city limits, but you see the red area, that is what is being annexed as well as being rezoned uh, with the annexation. Um, this is in Future District 1, Tommy Hebert, and it's in the Country Club neighborhood. So here is the zoning breakdown of that area that is still outside the city limits that we are annexing in. You see the top portion is 10.814 acres. That is combined with that area at the top. Uh, let's see if I can get it to put in the right spot right up in here. Um, that that will be a very large commercial area. We don't know exactly what they're going to do there, but it, uh, 10 acres plus is a great spot right on the loop um, with neighborhoods behind them. So we hope to see something very exciting uh, there that comes through. Then you see the 28, um, well, excuse me, not the 28, the 18 acres to the south. Uh, they are looking at a low-rise multifamily, which is RM1. So they are looking at some low-rise multifamily, but they are also looking at single-family, which is allowed in RM1. So there are multiple housing types that they are looking at. This group did come before Planning Commission and talk about the rezoning. Planning Commission asked them to go and visit with the folks out in the Butler Farm area. They did that a couple of times and got a lot of support from them for their concepts and their and what they're going to bring forward uh, when it comes to design and construction. And so uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the annexation and the service plan, as well as recommendation uh, to go from farm and ranch, uh, farm and uh, estates or ranch and estates to the RM1 multifamily for that lower portion and the uh, general commercial on the upper portion of that. It looks like we may have the acreages backwards there, um, but that's the general commercial is actually the 10 acres, the multifamily is the 18 acres. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Thank you. Questions for Aaron? Seeing none. Oh, yes, did you raise your hand? What about uh, city services, police, fire, 
uh, does this require a building a, another fire station or? Not quite yet, but I know this area, uh, as it continues to grow, um, I know the fire chief has looked in that part of town to say, where can we add one, particularly with stuff on the other side of the canal and the river, um, trying to figure out how that area is going to continue to grow. And with the extension of sewer services in the future out there, we expect it to continue to grow. Um, they're comfortable right now because they are responding to Butler Farms. Uh, obviously, Foster Road, we would like to see it improve and this, this group will have to do some incremental improvements along Foster Road to help with access and, and folks coming out of that area. I think our long term as a city is trying to figure what's the alternative access out of that area, if that's a connection back to Bentwood in some form or fashion, or what that may look like. Thank you. Yes, Tom. So, Aaron, I don't know if you can go back or if Brian can throw up a Google pic of where this is, but we've always had drainage and water issues right there and so i called a couple people butler farms and that's been a concern is while we've done some work it doesn't take a little bit of rain and it doesn't look like we've got it quite accomplished what we need to do to make it safe and run but um, as we build this is there kind of a corridor and a cushion because the butler farms are very nice houses large big plats and now we're moving something in that's pretty close lot lines are very narrow there's a cushion, I'm assuming, here that doesn't go much further back than what we have? Well, through this process, they will have to deal with their stormwater that's created off of their improved surfaces. They will have to mitigate that, usually through a detention system. I know that our operations department has been working with some other property owners through there to get drainage over to the Concho River. I uh, can't speak directly to what all they've worked on, but I know they've worked on some easements through there. Um, but this property will have to mitigate their stormwater. Our biggest question is, does any of that stormwater impact Foster? And so with the improvements that they have to make to, with Foster, that will have to be addressed at that time as well. And that may be something that our operations uh, team will also evaluate and say, is there something we need to do at this time to help some of those things as well? Well, and that's been the number one concern is once we get this thing started, that's going to be additional runoff that all goes into. Yes. And, and we've all born the phone calls or bared them of people in Foster. Uh, well, the good news is this hadn't been approved before, so when it hasn't been approved, they have to then do um, exactly. flood uh, they mitigation, the burden of it, et cetera. So, they bear the I mean, burden. They do. They do. So they can't do it without that, so it wouldn't get approved, so it forces that issue. Well, we would love to see that be repaired no matter who pays for it, but yeah. we prefer it being outside of our municipal budget. <laughs> but anyway, you answered the questions I have. Right. Further questions? Okay, then may I have a motion for approval? Moves approve it's presented. Thank you, Harry. Second. Second by Tom. Any public comment? Good morning again. Um, Anna Bartosh, single member district one. I live on River Valley over there and I don't know what they're expecting. Uh, there's only one way in, one way out of Butler Farms, and so they are increasing um, concentration of uh, homes and families and, and cars. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been over there on uh, Foster to off the loop. That's two-way. One way, <coughs> one way, one way. So uh, that road needs to be widened. Uh, yes, going into Butler, it is wider because Butler, the I guess the developer widened it, but the other one is narrow. Uh, and yes, you have been working on drainage and uh, it's been working, but we've not received the six inch rain that tested it before. If we ever receive that rain again, I'm anxious to see how well it really works uh, because the one, two inches would have worked anyway. Uh, so that's my comment. Just the ingress and egress needs to be uh, fixed. Thank you very much. Any further public comment? We'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 6-0. We'll move into item I, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance annexing into the city of San Angelo by petition of the property owner an unaddressed 15.496 acre tract out of A, 
Willicke, survey number two, abstract number 8211, and A. Willicke, survey number eight, abstract number 8102, Tom Green County, Texas, and two, an ordinance for Z23-13 to zone the 15.496 acre track located in the Meridian North subdivision located along the extension of Slade Street north of Royal Oak Street to the single family residential zoning district in blocks 5-7 and to the zero lot line twin home and townhome residential zoning district in block 8. Lucky you, you're on again. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, Aaron Vinoy, Assistant Director of Planning and Development Services. This is an area we're calling Meridian North. Uh, Meridian to the south. Uh, it's all called the Meridian, if you will. Uh, annex some area about uh, 2019 and have started building homes there along Slade uh, coming up um, to this northern area. So you see to the right is Red Oak and Coral. Uh, if you can uh, see that area that's just to the north, that's actually one of the arms of the Red Arroyo that comes back through there and then Pinyon Ridge and the, the development into Southland uh, goes further north. So this is future District 6, Mr. Larry Miller in the Bonham neighborhood. Um, we did have a plat that came forward um, to Planning Commission to replat this area into single family um, uh, housing uh, with the zoning of RS1 and RS3. So here is that northern uh, platted area. This is their preliminary plat. The area that is circled in red, that is the RS3 zoning. It is those uh, 11 lots right along there. And if you notice the tract A that's just to its uh, north uh, and east there, that is their detention pond that then backs up to the Red Arroyo. And so I want to just kind of vi let you visualize that. So if you see this kind of horn up here uh, uh, that's outlined in red, that's really where their detention is going to be. And there's actually a pretty significant separation between that and the housing on Pinyon Ridge. And I know that was some of the citizens' concerns, but once they understood how far some of the um, sing uh, zero lot line housing is going to be, they were very comfortable with that um, decision that Planning Commission made. Um, so again, those are the zero lot line or the RS3, which is their intention. It does allow twin home or zero lot line, but they have mentioned that they're looking at the zero lot line as uh, the market has shifted to some of those size homes. Uh, again, the rest is going to be the RS3 zoning that will be up Slade uh, of around Katrina and then down um, the other street there coming back down. So we did talk with the um, the service folks, again, the only concern that they had was a little bit of accessibility. Really, uh, Dominion down here on the south, it's not shown on the map, is really the way into this area. There's not a great way uh, to come across the Red Arroyo yet, but Royal Oak does connect in the next few years as that development finishes out, and so it's going to complete the connection. So they, they felt pretty comfortable being able to get in there, and it's a limited number of homes. Um, as we saw in the service um, discussion there, or on the 41 overall, uh, 41 lots, uh, RS1 and 11 RS3. So again, um, Planning Commission did approve the zoning for the RS1 and RS3, and we are recommending approval as well, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Larry, you want to make any comments? In that local area, there are other uh, twin homes identified in, in existence, so it's really not detracting from the overall appearance of the area. Correct. It's, it wouldn't be unusual to find that in some blocks in that in those areas through there. And as the developer has mentioned to us that, you know, the market has changed a little bit, and so he's wanting to make sure he can have a mix. And that also gives him an opportunity to maximize some of the lots right there along the Red Arroyo. And he's also thinking that that detention area he might make into some kind of a, an amenity area that would enhance those those homes as well. And fire services is really close by. Yes. They have to take a circuitous route in. They do have to come around, um, but they're going to make it in time. We, we feel confident in, their, in our <laughs> security service or our emergency services. They do a good job. Thank you, sir. Other questions or comments? May I have a motion for approval? Motion. Thank you, Larry. A second? A second by Karen. Any public comment on this item? Seeing none, hearing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. 
Motion passes 6-0. And the last one, item J, first yes. reading and public hearing of an ordinance for Z23-14 to rezone properties from the general commercial zoning district to the heavy commercial zoning district being 14.311 acres located at 3420, 3502, and 3550 North Bryant Boulevard and associated unaddressed partials. And you are on, Aaron. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we will make it through this one as well. So this is a rezoning that has come to us on our north side of town along North Bryant, Highway 87. On the east side there, you can see in the red outline a number of tracks that are unimproved at this time. Um, they are just kind of a vacant area coming in, but as we've seen over the last five years, there has been more growth along Bryant going to the north. Uh, so we're very excited that this is continuing that trend. Um, it is a request to go from general commercial to heavy commercial along those, those areas there. Uh, if you see at the road just barely coming in, it's not labeled there, but that's Humble Road. It's actually an arterial road, and so it will have to have some improvements over time. We'll have to have some discussions with TxDOT of how that comes in, uh, as there's no, I don't believe there's a crossover there. I don't remember exactly, uh, but the developer is aware of that, and they know that that's going to be a critical piece for them in the future. Uh, this is 14 acres in District 2, Tom Thompson, and the Riverside neighborhood. Here again is the, um, the current zoning. You can see all of that is general commercial. It has not developed that way uh, for whatever the reasons are. Uh, the applicant has come forward and wants uh, heavy commercial to um, start developing that as some, some kind of, not really retail sales, but rental of large equipment. Um, stuff that uh, on in that corridor, easy to get to the highway, get it out to wherever it needs to be, uh, whether that be industrious uh, uses or maybe even home uses. You see to the right, uh, back off of Lake Drive is our large single family residential, but those are large tract single homes. And then everything else to the west and some to the north is light manufacturing, which also is not quite developed that way. Um, and so we'll be potentially looking for other folks that wanna come in and do things there. Um, this is to the south. There are a number of general commercial and a couple of heavy commercial areas. And so we think this is a logical extension of the heavy commercial. We have discussed with the developer through a development review committee that they would have to protect the areas around the residential and they're aware of that uh, usually by some screening or fencing or, or things like that to mitigate uh, noise and site issues. Planning Commission and City staff recommends approval of this uh, going from the general commercial to the heavy commercial on those properties and they will then come forward with whatever design and plats and construction documents at that time. Tom, comments? There on the back side of this, back to the east, you don't see it, but there's some very large lots there. And, and what houses there, there's lots of cushion between the two. I have looked at this property for, uh, ever since I've lived, I turn on Humble three times a day. So anyway, long story short, it's good to see some development there. There's only one house, but it would also even make more sense, Aaron, to, we, we can't do it today, but that that's just west of the road needs to be turned into, you know, CG2. That's mm -hmm. just the path. That's how that's working. If you look back, um, Hirschfield, AFCO is just not far from this, operating within the same parameters that this is going to go forward. I see no hesitation and go ahead and make a motion to approve as is. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. Second by Lucy. Public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0. Aaron, thank you very much. You did a great thank job you, today. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. You were on, for, you were on front and center. Very good. There's no closed session today, so we'll move into item eight, follow up on administrative issues. Consider items discussed in executive session. As I just said, there are none. So we will now move into announcements and consideration of future agenda items. Are there any? You go ahead and put the request for the homeless task force on the agenda. Let's discuss. Okay. Okay, and then I'll we'll, we'll okay. do that. Okay. Very good. Okay. 
what we might do is uh, talk about the meetings in December because in the past we've only had one meeting in December and I understand that there's a need to do two meetings in December so let's make sure everyone has that on their calendar. I'll be here. Okay. I will be here. Okay. All right. So those dates would be what? The 5th and 19th. The 5th and the 19th will be our city council meetings in December. With that, may I have a motion for adjournment? Lucy made a motion. Do I have a second. second? Second by Tom Thompson. This meeting is officially adjourned at 10.17 a.m. Awesome.